as Gail said, this is a really pleasurable evening for me to be able to moderate this panel discussion. Um, we were fortunate in being able to get quite renowned speakers to join us tonight. And I'll just give you a quick overview and then introduce each of the topics that we have with us. And why don't you just uh, face the audience when I call your name, but Dr. Ron Mitchell from Chalk River Labs, looking at Bordeaux cells and cultures of mice. He's been testing the linear non-threshold hypothesis um, for a long time, and we're going to hear quite a bit from him this evening. I've also been fortunate enough to have a quick look at everyone's presentations ahead of time. So it's like the trailer for the movie. I know what to expect. Also, we have Dr. Salon Koss with us tonight from Berkeley Labs, and he's looked at uh, human breast tissue DNA and its ability to repair itself. Again, uh, another topic frankly quite near and dear to my heart. Um, Dr. Ted Rockwell is unable to join us this evening, but uh, we have, thanks to the techno technology capabilities of Tyler, we have Cal Abel with us. And Cal is a former uh, Navy nuclear officer and a PhD in nuclear and radiological engineering from my alma mater, Georgia Tech. And we have our enthusiastic and uh, well-renowned Corey Stansford with us. Uh, and uh, he will uh, share his own views on this topic. But within Westinghouse, he's a valuable and contributing concept designer for our small modular reactor. Several of you were at the last ANS meeting, local section that we had where Kate Jackson talked about that. I see some of the faces in the room, and uh, Corey was a part of that effort. So, so it's going to be, seriously, it's going to be an exciting night for us, and I'm really looking forward to it. We all watch the news, and we all hear the stories, and we all sit in a, wherever we sit and say, you know, if they only would listen to some other perspectives or listen to some data, we could help them understand a little bit better the truth about radiation and both its benefits and its detriments. In, in my uh, 30 year span, Gail said, can I say exactly how many years? I said, no, you guys are too good at math. So we just left it vague. So in my 30 plus years of experience, I started when I was eight, when you're not supposed to have radiation doses, but there you go. Uh, it was an interesting journey for me. I worked for at a utility, and some of you know I did work at a sister plant to TMI and also spent some time at Chernobyl. Caused neither event, but I'm helping with all of them. But one of the things that I had the privilege of being able to do was something uh, quite different on that journey. I worked with an Indian tribe, the Mescalero Apaches. How many people here have heard of uh, Cochise or Geronimo? Uh, virtually everybody in the room who watches old movies. And uh, Silas Cochise, great-grandson of Cochise, was my boss. So if you can imagine the literal war stories that I heard from him, for four years I lived on the Mescalero Apache Reservation in a place called the Inn of the Mountain Gods at the base of the Sacred Mountain. And uh, it was quite a nuclear journey. My role, if you can imagine this, this uh, uh, reservation was actually at the foothills of the uh, mountain range that was just above Alamogordo White Sands where they set off the first nuclear weapon. And several of the elders in the tribe actually remembered that morning because that was not an understandable event to them. If you can imagine the bright light in the sky and the sound wave that came through uh, later on. This was something uh, just uh, unimaginable in any of our perspectives. And they were given no advance warning, no knowledge of it. They also were based not so far from today in New Mexico, what, it, what is the uh, WIP facility, the Waste Isolation Power Plant, which is our, uh, the Waste Isolation Anyway, it's a disposal site where they bury uh, the waste underground in a salt deposit, and the salt kind of acts like a plastic and seals it into place. So it, it's a, an absolutely fascinating facility. But along with that, they were looking at opening a visitor center or an information center for tribal members. And 
and they thought it would be good for tribal members to have a better understanding because you also had Los Alamos laboratories, you had Sandia laboratories. New Mexico, although it has no uh, nuclear power except that that they cross over the borders to receive, is quite a nuclear cultured state. So they wanted to have a better understanding for tribal members and also see perhaps how they could benefit from some aspects of the nuclear industry. And so in that time period, I was asked to help set up this visitor center and we took an old facility and I went to all my friends in the nuclear industry and asked for, you know, samples. I had the Fiesta where the, the best one was the, uh, the chief of the tribe had on quite an impressive uh, turquoise belt buckle and he always wore it and when I was doing one of my demonstrations I took my little Geiger counter and uh, put it you know on, on his belt buckle and everyone was just all awestruck and, I, and, and he was brilliant he said chief no worry <laughs> well that was great if he doesn't worry no one else will but it was a good learning experience one of the things that we found out though and the theme that I wanted to introduce to you tonight was there was no tribal word for radiation. It's an ancient language, and so there was no direct translation. And so they thought about it for quite a while, and they decided that they needed some way to explain radiation in the ancestral language so that the elders could really have a better understanding of it. And they came up with, and there's a picture of a campfire on the screen for those of you who can't quite see it well, they came up with the phrase, hot rocks that shoot ghost bullets. <laughs> and if you think about it, it's pretty profound when you try to explain what spent fuel is or radiation. Hot rocks that shoot ghost bullets. And what I want to ask tonight is, are the ghost bullets harmful? Are they helpful? or do they simply pass right through us? So as we go through today, let's think about those hot rocks that shoot ghost bullets and come to our own conclusions. So enough about me, we have this incredible panel with us today, and I want to start with Dr. Mitchell. And Dr. Mitchell from Chalk River Labs uh, will study the effects, uh, studies the effects of low doses on cells in culture and with mice. He's been testing the linear non-threshold uh, hypothesis by examining low doses of LET radiation. Uh, how many people here, by the way, because I'm happy, I'm sure Dr. Mitchell will, to go through linear non-threshold. Gail briefly spoke about that. Does everybody have a clear understanding of what the difference between that is and hormesis? Are you going to... So, 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 the, so the gist of it is that there are two models out there. The old, the old fashioned model, and the model upon which um, a lot of the regulations are based, is the fact that we all know at high um, doses radiation it is harmful. And a matter of fact, we use that harm sometimes in a positive way in therapies, etc. So, so the linear non-threshold theory simply says that if we extrapolate down to where we statistically really can't see the effects because they're buried in the effects that, that occur elsewise, we can still expect some harm from radiation. So the linear non-threshold simply says there's no safe dose associated with radiation exposure. What we're here to talk about today and have some opinions that you don't often hear perhaps in the media or, or in the regulatory environment is radiation hormesis. And I have from Joel Kaufman, uh, a professor um, from the University of Sciences in Philadelphia, a very nice definition of it. Uh, radiation hormesis is the fact that when low doses of radiation or other treatments lead to improved health, fitness, or lifespan in a positive direction, um, that, that, uh, that that can be called uh, essentially radiation hormesis or hormesis depending on the phenomenon. So at high doses, even things like aspirin at high doses can be very harmful, but yet we've all taken an aspirin and, and it brings us uh, health. One of the things I went online today and I was trying to find some examples. There was a woman, we've all heard this I think probably on, on the internet, but there, was, there have been several people who have actually died from water poisoning. They drink too much water. Um, she drank 60 glasses of water, had some incurable thirst, and actually died that evening from it. They found her organs essentially um, in a frothy sort of a state because she had 
had so much water to drink, and yet without that simple glass of water, we would all be dead. And so it, it's a matter of how much. And so if all other things seem to behave in this sort of same way, where there's some, some small spectrum perhaps where, where things are beneficial, and then some other part of the spectrum where they're not, can we not look at the data more objectively and see what conclusions we can draw regarding radiation? And that's what we're here to talk about tonight with some really rather convincing data. And I think data is the best way to talk about this because it's a very, you know, you go to your friends and neighbors and how do you explain it? You explain it through data and information. People have come to trust that. So without further description from me, I'm going to turn the uh, sand over. We're going to hear each of the speakers with a brief presentation a few questions afterwards, and then at the end, including our virtual speaker, which is why we have four chairs, I guess, we're going to have uh, an actual panel discussion. So after each speaker, you'll have a chance to ask questions, jot them down, and, and we'll come to them. And then at the end, hopefully, we'll have uh, quite a significant dialogue amongst ourselves. So with no further introduction from me, Dr. Mitchell, please. assumptions that are built into the linear no threshold hypothesis and, and, and how they're used and applied in our current radiation protection system and then compare those assumptions to the data that we find when we actually do experiments with low doses, what actually happens. So as it says, it's kind of a biological reality check. So here is basically what Rita just described to you, a linear no threshold hypothesis which says that risk is directly proportional to dose without a threshold, and this data here is basically uh, generally, and, and, and to a very large extent, uh, based on the A-bomb, Japanese A-bomb survivors. And that's often referred to as the gold standard for human epidemiology. And it's been used and still is being used since the Second World War. And, and that data produces a reasonable approximation of a straight line for doses which are above about a 100 or 50 milligram. And, and, and that is then, uh, because the, the doses below that, as Randy explained, are, are lost in the statistical noise, there's no actual evidence for, for harm below those doses, we make the assumption that we can simply extrapolate that, that linear portion down to zero. So it says that every dose, no matter how low, produces some risk. What I'm going to argue with to you uh, is that this isn't actually true at all, and that the curve actually looks something like this. That is, uh, that when the dose falls below a certain point, it reaches a threshold, at which point there, there is no increased risk, and below that, there is what I call negative risk, or protection, if you, if you like. Okay, so I've summarized on this uh, slide then some of the more basic assumptions that we that fall out of the uh, LNT hypothesis and that we use for radiation protection. First and foremost, we use doses of surrogate for risk. I mean, we're really trying to measure risk, but we can't measure risk, but we can easily measure dose. So we're using dose as a surrogate for risk. We're not actually measuring risk in the radiation protection system. It says that the risk per unit dose is constant. It is because it's linear. It's no threshold, and that's true overall. That is overall for the whole person, and it's true also for each tissue of the person. Some of the risks of the tissues, of course, create the overall risk for the person. It says that dose, i.e. risk, is additive. That means the dose you get today can be added to the dose you get tomorrow, and the dose you get the next day, and it just sums up, and risk sums up in that way. Normally, we normalize doses, uh, in terms of uh, radiation weighting factors and tissue weighting factors. Radiation weighting factors are uh, weighting factors for different kinds of radiation other than low LET, 
that is other than things like x-rays and gamma rays. So alpha radiation would be a high LAT radiation and we assign a radiation weighting factor, i.e. multiplier of 5, 10, 20, depending on the type of radiation. We use tissue weighting factors, which says that each tissue contributes some amount of risk and, and, and to the total risk. And when we do that, we don't use the real term for those, which is gray. We normalize it and then we turn, call it sieverts. Sieverts is actually not a unit of dose, it's a unit of relative risk. We also say that dose can only increase, that is, there is no dose that you can give that can do anything except increase risk. Every dose increases risk. And the little bit of biology that's built into the LNT is that at low doses and dose rates, risk is reduced twofold over high doses and dose rates. So we have a, what's called a dose and dose rate effectiveness factor of two. All this is applied into the operational approach into something called ALARM, as low as reasonably achievable which says that since logically every dose produces a risk, you want to reduce the dose as low as reasonably achievable. So that's a perfectly logical extension of the LNT hypothesis. So that's the assumptions that we're working with today in all radiation protection. So you can kind of keep these things in mind as I go through some of the arguments in the data. So the question then, is this, whoops, is this true at low doses of low LET, low energy transfer radiation like x-rays and gamma rays? Uh, and I'll be speaking primarily about gamma radiation. We know it's reasonably true for high doses. So, when you irradiate a cellular organism, what, what actually are you doing to that cellular organism? Well, the cell doesn't see radiation. What it sees is a change in the environment. And that change in the environment creates a stress to that cell. And there's a basic rule in biology. If you would change the environment and you were creating a stress, there's only two choices. You adapt or you die. And that's true at the level of the individual, and it's true at the level of the species. And we see it now with global warming, of course. But change the environment, create a stress, and that's your choice. So what I'm going to talk about is something known as an adaptive response. But it, it does go beyond that. But generally, you can think of this as an adaptive response. It says that exposure of cells or organisms to radiation at a low dose and low dose rate or to any other mild stress, but it's a stress that's a physical stress to the organism. That induces mechanisms that protect against detrimental effects of other events and agents, including radiation. So a low dose of radiation or a low or mild stress induces these protective effects, and re that reduces your risk from other major stresses. Now, the thing I want to emphasize is that there's nothing magical about adaptive responses to radiation. They're really just part of a general stress response. That is, you can stress an organism in many ways. You can stress an organism with heat, you can stress an organism with lack of nutrition, you can stress an organism in a number of ways. Now, what I want to show you in some experiments, that other stressors can modify radiation risk, and vice versa. Radiation can modify the risk of other stressors as well. So there's nothing unique about these stress responses. They're a general stress response. And the other thing to keep in mind is that organisms, including humans, aren't usually exposed to just a single stressor. Even if you're exposed to radiation, you may go home and sit in your hot tub. Well, that's a stress. So there's lots of stresses that, that happen to people, and they affect the outcome of radiation exposure. So I'm going to make these arguments to you and show you some. Oh, one more slide. Uh, we have seen adaption to radiation in every organism that's ever been examined on this planet, from single cell organisms all the way up to mammals, including humans, no exceptions. This says to any biologist, this is a very tightly evolutionarily conserved response. And anything that's conserved throughout the whole of evolution has got to be an important response. Otherwise, we, we would discard it throughout evolution. It may be important for a plant, but not for a vertebrate. So this is, these are basic, ancient type responses, tightly conserved. Okay, so what do we know about these responses? Well, we're, we're thinking of this now in the context of, of radiation risk, so we're thinking about it mostly in the context of cancer, which is the thing we think about most of the time in radiation risk. And, and, and I've listed here the things that are uh, protective mechanisms that are induced in cells by stresses that we think are important in the cancer process. The first one uh, is, of course, when we uh, irradiate or somehow damage DNA, excuse me, um, 
An important response is DNA repair. You have to correctly repair the DNA, and we're going to hear a lot more about that from the next speaker. If the DNA in the cell is not correctly repaired, next thing that's supposed to happen is a process of, that's called apoptosis, which is a built-in program for cell suicide. If a cell doesn't properly repair its damage, it's supposed to activate that program and commit suicide. That takes the cell out of the risk bin. It's not good for the cell, obviously, but it takes the risk away from the organism. So, so that's what's supposed to happen. If that happens, then the, the damaged cell disappears and there's no risk. If that doesn't happen, then there's something called bystander effects take over. Other cells around that cell, and maybe even distant from that cell, will recognize that that cell is somehow modified, not behaving properly, and they will send what are called death signals to that damaged cell, forcing it to turn on its apoptotic program and commit suicide. If that happens, good, you're out of the woods again. If it doesn't happen, then we call on the immune surveillance system. That's the same immune surveillance system that recognizes invading viruses, bacteria, etc., 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 and low doses then stimulate this, and, and the immune surveillance systems, the cytotoxic T cells, the natural killer cells, will go out, find, and kill, kill those damaged cells. And if that happens, then you're good to go too. If it doesn't happen, now you're probably going to get cancer sometime. So all these things kind of have to happen, and if, if they all happen, or any one of them happens, you're okay. So let's look at the effect of low doses on some of these things. Okay, so these are some, uh, some experiments looking at, at chromosomal breaks, broken chromosomes, and the ability to repair broken chromosomes in human, uh, normal human skin fibroblasts. We give these skin fibroblasts a variety of doses, from 1 milligray up to 500 milligray at low dose rates and allow them a repair period. We can't tell the difference between these things and control. So all these, the cells repair all the all the broken chromosomes, stick them all back together, and everything's good. If we give a big dose of radiation, here's four gray, a high dose rate, now we see we have a lot of unrepaired chromosomes left over. So this is then presumably creating risk to these cells because they're, these are damaged cells unrepaired. Now let's look what happens when we give these doses, followed three hours later by the four gray. The LNT hypothesis tells us that if we add dose, no matter what the dose is, then the risk in this case to these cells, it's got to go up. But it doesn't. The risk goes down. These low doses increase the ability of the cells to repair broken chromosomes and reduce the number of broken chromosomes down that much. Clearly it doesn't take all the damage away from the cells, but it goes in the negative direction. The other thing to notice here is that it didn't really matter whether we gave 1 milligray or 500 milligray, 500 times the dose, we got exactly the same response. Now, one milligray, because this is cobalt 60 gamma, is about an average of one track per cell. So this is about as low a dose as you can give a cell. So what this is saying then is that the first track through the cell induces these protective mechanisms, in this case, improved DNA repair. And it didn't matter whether you put more tracks through the cell, <coughs> but slowly, because this is a low dose, we still got just as much, no more, no less, protective effect. So this is clearly a nonlinear dose response and it's a nonlinear protective type of dose response. I show you this slide for two reasons. One is it's done in, in catfish cells, and then just to reinforce the idea that this is nothing, nothing uh, unique to human cells. We're looking at lymphocytes from catfish cells, and we're doing the same experiment, looking at broken chromosomes, and we're giving, this is the control, we're giving four gray, and you see there's a big a uh, number of unrepaired broken chromosomes from, from that dose, as you would expect. Okay, so what happens if we give now 500 milligray at low dose before we give this 4 gray? Well, now we see we've improved the repair of the 4 gray down to the control level. So that now in these catfish cells, we've stimulated them clearly more than we did in the human lymphocyte, in the human fibroblast, but we've removed the risk of the 4 gray by this additional dose, which is exactly the opposite of what the LNT says should happen. Now we're going to add another stress to this. We're going to add 15 milligrams per liter of chlorine. We're going to incubate these cells in chlorine. And then we're going to give them their low dose inducing dose and see what happens. Well, same thing happens. This low dose induces a protective effect which removes all the effects of the fluid rate. So, so good, so far so good. However, now we're going to increase the stress, the total stress to these cells, going from 15 to 25 milligrams per liter of chlorine. We give them the 500 milligrams, and now look what happens. 
no more adaptive response. The forward rate produces the same increment of damage that it did in cells which are, have never seen an inducing growth. So the total stress that we apply to these cells now, not just the radiation stress, has pushed them through a threshold. It's a stress threshold, a combination of chlorine, of all things, and, and radiation. But the stress now has pushed them through a threshold so that the, the low doses are no longer protected. So you can have low doses protected, low doses not protected, depending on the total stress in the organism. Okay, so here's the second process. This is the process of apoptosis, and these are normal human lymphocytes that I got from a few buddies. Here's one guy done twice, two others, and this is the average. So we're looking, we're giving a big dose, three gray, and we're asking how many of the cells commit suicide, initiate their apoptotic program. And you see about 15% of the cells initiate their apoptotic program. So they're being, they're, they've been, they recognize they weren't properly repaired, and they committed suicide. However, if we give 10 centigrade the day before we give this 3 gray and then do the experiment again, now a lot more cells commit suicide than, than did, did before. The low dose has increased the ability of the cells to recognize that they haven't completely repaired themselves and to activate their apoptotic program. And probably influence uh, each other by bystander effects, although we don't have good data on that. So that's an apoptosis Moved out to. Question. Yep, yep. How do you know the death is by, uh, by apoptosis? Oh, the there's, there are there's clear cytogenetic markers for death by apoptosis, where the DNA is broken up into large chunks. It isn't just degraded. There's a whole histological and cytogenetic markers for, okay. for, for this type of cell process. And, and, and you're right, there's another cell process called necrosis, which is basically hit him with a hammer kind of death, right? And everything gets smashed. This is a, an enzymatically driven, chop up the DNA kind of process. So it's very clear that they're dying by this process. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is this now is looking at immune system cells, and and, and asking what happens from a low dose uh, to immune cells. Now, so we're looking at uh, the production of cytotoxic T cells, and in order to activate the immune system, the immune system has to get a signal. The immune system cells have to get a signal to the body. And that signal to the body is called interleukin-2. Now, in order to, to receive this signal, the cells have to have a receptor on their, on their membrane in order to receive this interleukin-2 uh, signal. So we're looking at the production, or how many cells are expressing these interleukin-2 receptors, because that's the key to turning them into dividing cells, which then allows them to grow up and kill cancer cells. So in control cells, about 8% of the cells are expressing these receptors. If we give the cells 10 milligrams, you see the number of cells expressing the receptor is about doubles, double. So, so they've, they've recognized that they've received a, a signal, a stress, and they've turned on the receptors saying, okay, here I am waiting for the signal to divide and go out and kill these bad cells. Okay, we did another experiment then. We took these cells, the irradiated cells, and mixed them 50-50 with the control cell. Now you'd expect that that would just dilute out the effect, and, it would, and the number of cells expressing the receptor would be somewhere between the two. But in fact, at least as many cells are expressing this receptor as if they were all irradiated. And that's because of bystander signals. That is, the unirradiated, the irradiated cells are talking to the unirradiated cells, sending them signals which says, we've been irradiated, you guys need to turn on your receptor because you're probably going to get a signal to divide and go and do this thing. So these cells talk to each other. And, and you can easily understand then that these are nonlinear processes. If you having non-irradiated cells responding to signals from irradiated cells, these are non-linear with those, obviously. Okay. So all this stuff is going on in the cells. So the next question then is, it, does this have anything to do with risk? Because that's usually what we're worried about in radiation protection is risk. It's nice to know what's going on. but So we do an experiment here. And, and when you're doing growing cells in a tissue culture dish, about the closest you can come to a measure of risk as we you would normally understand it, is to ask how many cells turn into cancer cells. And that's what means what's meant by the plastic transformation here. Okay, so if we just grow the cells in the, in the tissue culture disk, about 1.8 and 10 to 3 cells turn into cancer cells. That's just the price of being alive and growing in addition to that. Now, we gave some of these cells 1 milligrade, some 10 milligrade, some 100 milligrade, so a hundredfold difference in dose, and see what happened now. The, the number in the LNT hypothesis, of course, says that if you irradiate cells, you're going to increase the risk of them turning into cancer cells. Well, it isn't what happens. In fact, you decrease the risk. You're right, the risk, the risk goes down by three or four fold. 
And it didn't matter whether we get one milligram, which remember is about one traffic per cell, or we get a lot of traffic per cell, we got the same response. These, these are not different from each other. So again, it's saying the first track through the cell produces the full response. Have we heard this before? I think so. Uh, and, and it didn't matter whether you put more tracks through the cell. And it is a negative risk, if you like, protective effect. Okay, so that's all well and good. That all happens in cells, but what we're really worried about is risk in vivo, in real life, in full, real walking around mammals, right? So does any of this apply? Can you see this in, in, in mammals when we talk about life? But before I talk, I will talk about cancer, but before I talk about cancer, I want to show you something we're doing more recently on non-cancer diseases, because this non-cancer diseases are not a big, hot topic in radiation protection. Everybody's tired of cancer, I guess, and now we're talking about non-cancer diseases, particularly diseases of diseases of the circulatory system, and in particular, atherosclerosis. So we did some experiments in mice which are prone to atherosclerosis, and they're prone because we, they're genetically deactivated for production of a protein called apolipoprotein E, which is the protein that allows macrophages, a certain kind of cell, to mobilize lipids that are stuck to the walls of arteries. If you can't mobilize the lipids, then you get this kind of stuff going on. This is ascending the order out of the heart. You get deposits, fatty deposits, which grow in size, they grow in severity, and eventually they form necrotic lesions which can cause a burst in the coronary artery wall, and i.e. you get a heart attack. Right? So this is what this is at a pretty advanced stage, obviously, uh, in, in these mice. So we asked what happens when you give a low dose of radiation to these mice that develop this, this atherosclerosis spontaneously. Okay, spontaneously because they're genetically programmed to do it. So we're, we're looking here now at lesion size. So on the unradiated mice, this is the size of the lesions here. And when we gave doses, our lowest dose was 25 milligrams, this is 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams, and 500 milligrams. See, all of those doses produced a slowing down of lesion growth. The lesions were not as big. They didn't progress to a larger size as rapidly as the unradiated cells. In other words, the low dose of radiation were slowing down the progression of the growth of these lesions in the aorta in these mice. And it, obviously this is a nonlinear process, and it's going again in the wrong direction, the, the wrong direction as we'd be predicted by the LMT. We're getting a reduction in risk as measured by the size of the lesions compared to unradiated mice. So we were, these mice, by the way, were exposed at two months of age, and we examined them six months later. So you can see how long these effects last in, in these, and this is a single dose, right? 25 milligrams is a single dose, it lasts for at least six months. Uh, the other measure of risk from atherosclerosis is lesion severity, and it's, and it's rated on a scale of 1 to 5, least severe 1, most severe 5, and at this point you're forming necrotic lesions in, in the, in these, in these necrotic centers in these lesions, and you're in danger of risk. So we measured also uh, lesion severity, and what we have here is, is uh, stages 4 and 5, which are the most severe, and up here stages 1 and 2. And so you see now, here's the unirradiated mice, and you see that the lowest dose that we gave, which is 25 milligram, cut the number of the most severe lesions by about half. And now this was three months after we irradiated the mice, the mice at two months of age. And, and correspondingly, the least severe lesions increased in, in frequency. So again, we're inhibiting this whole process in terms of both growth of lesion size and, and increase in lesion severity. So we're inhibiting non-cancer disease, an important non-cancer disease that's linked to radiation risk at high doses by we're inhibiting by giving low dose of radiation. Okay, cancer. Now, there's a lot of ways you can form cancer. You can form it from chemical exposure, you can form cancer from radiation exposure, or you can form cancer spontaneously from whatever, right? This one is an experiment where we're looking at skin tumors in mice, that the cancer is being initiated by a chemical carcinogen called methyl nitrobitrosal quantity. And we apply a, a dose of that to the mouse's skin. And then we apply multiple doses of a tumor promoter. And when we do this, we get on the average about two tumors, two skin tumors per mouse. If we irradiate with beta radiation, we get half a gray uh, at low dose rate. And this is strongly original beta radiation. And then apply the tumor promoter. We get no tumors. So it looks like beta radiation didn't do anything. But in fact, it had, because if we do the beta radiation the day before we apply this chemical carcinogen, we see that the number of tumors that finally appear is reduced by about five or so. So 
a low dose of radiation now has protected the mouse skin from chemically initiated tumor injection. So we're protecting against cancer, but this is chemically derived cancer. Okay, so here's, uh, here's a mouse experiment looking at, at leukemia. Um, we're, we're, we're giving these mice leukemia. We're, we're, we're plotting decreasing survival with increasing time. We give a dose back here, and, uh, we're plot and we give one gray of, of, of uh, radiation, cobalt 60 gamma radiation, and, uh, and this produces le myeloid leukemia in some of the mice. So here's the survival curve of the mice, control mice, and the mice that received one gray did not get myeloid leukemia. That's the myeloid leukemia negative. And the red symbols are the mice that developed leukemia uh, as a result of this one gray. So you can see they lost maybe a third of their lifespan approximately because we gave them myeloid leukemia as a, as a result of this one gray dose. Okay, so what happens now if we give an additional dose? Again, we gave these mice 100 milligray at low dose rate the day before we gave them cancer from the one gray. And so what happens? Again, the LNT would say, you add more dose, you increase the risk, right? So some of you, the numbers got, the cancer's got to go up, or the latency period's got to go down, one or the other. Well, the number of cancers didn't actually change. The incidence didn't change. Each one of these is, is one mouse. There's about 250 mice per group in this experiment. But what happened was, we gave the mice back about half the lifespan that they lost because we gave them cancer from a big dose. So, so the low dose is counteracting the cancer by increasing the latency, giving them back some of the lifespan that they lost. So it's the protective effect. Again, exactly the opposite of what the LNT would do. Now, at the beginning of the talk, I remember I was stressing the idea that different stresses, there's nothing unique about, about radiation stress. This is a radiation stress, 100 milligrams. There's nothing unique about this. We can do this with other things. So we repeated this experiment exactly, but we didn't give them 100 milligram as the inducing stress. We gave them increased body temperature. We raised their core temperature to 40 and a half degrees for 60 minutes. So this is about the shortest fever that most of them had. And then we did that 24 hours before we gave them cancer from one break. And it, what happened? Exactly the same thing. It's just another stress. We gave them back again about half the lifespan that they lost because we gave them, great, we gave them cancer from one break. So it's behaving exactly like a minor radiation stress. A stress is a stress is a stress. Okay, so in the radiation detection business, we're not usually worried about <clears throat> chemically induced cancers or radiation induced cancers. We're just usually worried about the risk of low doses by themselves. So what happens if you just give the low dose by itself? So we did here what's probably a, a, a worst case scenario. We gave low doses to cancer prone mice. These mice were cancer prone because we had partially inactivated a gene called TRP53. And if any of you were interested, I'll talk about that. But Normal mice, these are genetically normal mice, they develop lymphomas in most <coughs> old age, kind of like people develop cancer in most in people old age. And the cancer prone mice, the black symbols here, develop cancer in most middle age. They're cancer prone, so you, you, they get cancer earlier in their lifespan. So what happens when we irradiate these cancer prone mice with either 10 milligray when they're eight weeks old or 100 milligray? And this is the appearance now at the time of, of these uh, lymphomas. But what happens was, same thing that happened when we were producing cancer with radiation, and these are we're, we're now producing cancer spontaneously. We gave the mice back some of the lifespan that they lost because they were cancer prone. It took them maybe 25% of the way back to a normal mouse. We gave them an increased life. They still got they still got lymphoma, spontaneous lymphoma, although it looked like the frequency maybe was reduced a bit, although I couldn't prove that statistic. And the other thing you notice is that it didn't really matter whether we gave 10 milligray or 100 milligray. We got about the same response. It's starting to sound familiar again, isn't it? Yeah. You get the same response, it doesn't matter what the dose is, as long as it's low. So again, for this tissue type then, lymphoma type uh, cells, a low dose, either 10 or 100 milligray, produced a protective effect. So clearly, we're still below a harmful threshold. If we raise the dose high enough, clearly we increase the the frequency and latency of, uh, and decrease the latency of these lymphomas, but we haven't got to the threshold yet. So, is this true for all tissues in the mouse then, or is it different for different tissues? Is the next question we ask. So, same experiment, same mice, different tissue. We're looking at bone cancer, spinal osteocytomas in these same mice. 
So here's the spontaneous appearance in the, of, of spinal osteosarcomas in these cancer prone mice, the black symbols. Here's the 10, what happened with 10 million, right? She has a long delay in the appearance of the first uh, osteosarcoma, and then all the osteosarcomas appear later. So we increase latency, so we improve the survival of the mice from osteosarcoma by 10 milligrams. But look what happened when we gave 100 milligrams. We still see some initial delay, but by and large, we now accelerate the appearance of these sarcomas, osteosarcomas. So clearly, in these mice then, between 10 and 100 milligrams for this tissue type, bone, we've gone through a threshold from protective effects to detrimental effects. So in the same organism, the same mouse then, we see that different tissues have different thresholds. The lymphoma's threshold is clearly above 100 million, right? And here is somewhere between 10 and 100 million. So the threshold for a whole person or a mouse is not going to be a sharp cutoff in some magic dose. It's going to be some gradual transition depending on what tissue type or what tumor type you're going to be looking at. So it's going to be, some are going to increase in risk as you go up in dose before others are going to increase in risk. So it's overall risk is going to gradually transition from protective effects to detrimental effects. Okay, so how does this compare then to the human data? And here's a fairly recent uh, 2011 paper looking at oste bone sarcomas, osteosarcomas in the A-bomb survivors. Uh, it, the, the authors are, are plotting something called re uh, excess relative risk. So this is, this is risk in excess of the control population that they use. So all these data points down here show no excess risk. And when, only when you get to these doses are the, perhaps the data points in excess of the control. So they they put in, they tried various models, linear, linear threshold, various models to explain this data. But I'm going to point out something now about tricks that epidemiologists use. They made an assumption here that the only thing you can have from a radiation exposure is, is risk that is in excess of the control. So anything that's not in excess of the control is by definition zero. If you actually plot their data, as they did, and you take the observed uh, minus the expected, which if they were exactly the same, would produce zero, so that's really the control level, you see that the lower doses actually were less than the control. So when you plot it in an unbiased way, then you get risk which is less than the control, which would be zero. And these points, these higher dose points, still, of course, show excess risk. They're above their control. So when you draw the line like this now, you see that there's a threshold. There's a threshold somewhere around maybe 0.8 gray. And now you get protective effects at low doses in these human A-bomb survivor population. So when you look at human epidemiology, be very suspicious about how they've treated the data because they make assumptions and they don't tell you about those assumptions either. So that now brings me to Avon survivors, which I said at the beginning was often referred to as, as the gold standard for, rate, for epidemiology. And I stress throughout the talk that, that stresses will do the same thing and show you data how stress can modify uh, the outcome of radiation exposure. Now if you think about any population that's stressed, I can't think of a population that's more stressed than, than these people. They've had an A-bomb drop in their heads for heaven's sakes. So they're exposed to radiation, they're exposed to physical trauma from the blast, they're exposed to burns from the blast, they, their city is destroyed, their houses are destroyed, they have no food, they have nutritional stress, they have no housing, no blankets, they're sleeping out on wherever if they're alive, so they're undergoing thermal stress. And yet, the only thing that's considered in the epidemiology is the radiation. And the biology tells us that the radiation effects depend on the sum of all the stresses. So when you're looking at data like this, you have to think about what human data, you have to think about what stresses that people have gone through and how that is going to affect the outcome. So from this, I think, from all of this, maybe there's a few lessons for epidemiologists when you're talking about low radiation doses. LNT responses are highly improbable. I mean, evolution tells us that this is not going to happen in any organism and not going to happen in humans because we're just a product of the evolution of all the rest of the things on this planet. So they're highly unlikely. And when we and, and, and epidemiologists frequently plot incidence changes 
But when we do these low dose experiments in animals, what we see typically are latency changes. We see changes in when the disease appears, not how many of them develop uh, the disease. And we need to control for other stressors. And that isn't just the A-bomb survivor data. It's people, you know, when you do human epidemiology, not very often you ask people what drugs they're taking. You don't ask them whether they spend every Friday in a hot tub. And if you're talking about radiation workers, you don't ask them if they're walking around in a plastic suit and we measured the, the internal temperature of the radiation workers in plastic suits. And believe me, it's not 37 degrees. So all these things are going to contribute to stresses to the people and are going to influence the outcome. And, I, and, and I, the last point here is genetics is important, and I never talk about genetics because I don't have time to. But P53, the gene TRP53 and the protein P53 is very important for these defensive responses. And we know in the human population that the P53 gene has a lot of SNP, what we call SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which means that there's one base change in the gene. And this changes, of course, the protein that's produced. And, and we know that there's variations in the, in the activity of the P53 pro protein in human populations. And these, these P53 SNPs are ethnically clustered. So the P53 SNPs that you see in the Japanese population is going to be different from those you see in the Italian population. So translating risks from one population, one ethnic group to another ethnic group is fraught with a lot of difficulties because the protective processes are dependent on this gene, which is variable in the human population. All right, so final slide. Um, I think the implications for radiation protection, as far as I can determine from all the experiments I've done, every assumption based on the LNT is wrong. It's wrong for biological, biological reasons. We can't use doses of surrogate for risk. Some doses increase risk, some doses decrease risk. You can't add them up for the sake for that reason, unless you're willing to think about negative doses. I think that's probably too much for any reasons. We certainly can't add up doses like we like we typically do with radiation protection. Again, for the same reason, some increase risk, some decrease risk. Dose and dose rate effectiveness factor is usually the ratio of what happens at a low dose to what happens at a high dose, and that's taken as two. But if a high dose, a high dose rate produces a positive effect, and a low dose produces a protective effect, that's a negative effect. So what's the dose effectiveness factor? Well, it's infinity, it's not two. It's a positive number over a negative number. We can't use tissue weighting factors, which are assumed to be independent of dose, because as I've showed you in that mouse experiment, they aren't independent of dose. They have thresholds, just like every tissue has a threshold. And so they have thresholds of different, you know, different doses. And that'll be true for humans too. So there'll be tissue weighting factors for doses above a certain dose, and tissue weighting factors which are negative for doses below a certain dose. Same thing with radiation weighting factors. If you have a high LAT radiation like alpha, which produces a positive effect, a radiation weighting factor normalizes that to a low, a low dose of a low rate of a low LAT radiation. But if you have a positive effect here and, and, the negative, and a negative effect from a, a low LAT radiation, how do you do the relationship? It doesn't, you can't relate a high, a positive dose to a, to a negative dose. So these are the things that turn the real dose, that is grace, into sieverts. So when people talk about sieverts at low dose, it doesn't make any sense. Seabirds have no meaning in those. And finally, Alara, and I think we're going to hear more about that, uh, as low as reasonably achievable, uh, I call that Alara min, because reducing the dose can produce actual negative effects, effects that you don't want in the human people. So that's a, a thing to avoid. So finally then, I'll argue that we need a new approach to radiation protection of low doses for for all these biological reasons. Thanks. So let me go ahead and take one or two clarifying questions and then I'll sure. move on. Just be able to for yourself. Sure. Yeah? Yeah. So I know we're weird in the US and we don't use the metric system here. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> so can you relate um, how the milligrade, like yeah, what I, background I, radiation um, uh, a, a, a rad is a rem, you know, and, it, and, and it's a centigrade, okay, so it's, it's a hundredth of a grade. So a, a gray is a, is, is, geez, 10 rem, 100 rem, 100 rem. Like what would background radiation grays be? Oh, uh, well it's usually measured in, in sieverts, 
and that drives me wild too. But anyway, it's usually the worldwide average background radiation in milligrade is about an annual dose of maybe two and a half. But that doesn't really tell you about the range of, of background doses that we that are exist around the world where people live, right? So they live in background doses that range from maybe one milligrade to as high as eight hundred milligrade in certain parts of the world. So this is per year. This is per year. So there's a huge range in background radiation doses. Okay, one more. Just the, I was doing the conversion, by the way. Oh, I was doing exactly what you were doing. 20 years ago, I can do this. I can't do it in my head anymore because I haven't used it for 20 years. This may be a relatively simple and remedial question, actually, but what do we consider being low doses? Because in the field, when I, when I have to go under OSHA guidelines and I'm in the field and I've got a dosimeter on my chest, yeah. I'm limiting myself annually. Most companies will shut you off with one REM per year, and you're not allowed by law to go to two and a half or yeah. normal operations, yeah. and that's, you're talking yeah. only a you know, 20 milligram total yeah. per year, and I didn't see any time basis for the, the, the biology. The, 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 most of the things I showed you were, were single exposures, yeah. right. okay. but they were done at what I call low dose rate, which is a milligram a minute, because biologically, that's a low dose rate. You see these, you see these responses at doses like a milligram a minute or lower and maybe a bit higher. When you get like 100 milligram a minute, that's a high dose rate, and you get high dose rate times of responses. Yeah, in the radiation protection business, we're worried about doses that are likely nonsensical. Uh, I mean, if you look at, the, even if you look at the human epidemiology data in worst case conditions, which would be an A-bomb survivor, which is at high, the highest dose rate you could probably think of, and they can't see any human risk below about 50 to 100 milligrams, okay? And, 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 and that's a fairly big population. Now, I'd say, I'd say that's a, a terrible population to look at, but it is a population, if anything, the extra stresses are going to drive these low doses to produce risk, not the other way around. So this is, this is probably a worst case scenario, and you still can't see any risk at 50 or 100 milligrams. So that tells you that we are off scale in our radiation protection practices. Just completely off scale. So he's talking milligram. A lot of what you'd be measuring would be micro. Right? Well, you right. Yeah, and At our place, they measure yeah. nano seeker. Nano well, seeker. So yeah, I mean, they yeah. never. Right. And micro grade per minute translates to six rem per hour, mm -hmm. just as a translational. Mm -hmm. field. It's, it's wow. right. You're out. That, that 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 half an hour at that rate exposes you gives you more than your annual allowance. I, just, I didn't talk about it, but. There is a bottom end to this, and you have to get enough dose to actually produce a stress to produce these effects. Okay? I mean, if you don't get enough dose, you don't produce the effective or dose rate. You don't produce these protective effects. So, if you're not getting enough radiation to work, go home and sit in your hot tub. <laughs>